How's it going? Everybody feeling all right? I've been having some trouble with this microphone. I'm going to toss it in the back here. If we get a conversation going, please do have the mind to pass it around for everybody. We'll see if it works, but... Any questions before I start? About anything at all? Comments? Bob Dylan won the Nobel Prize for Literature. That's something. Come on in. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see. A few people might actually be out of the cave. Might be back in the cave after being out of the cave. Um, we're talking about... Ooh, terrible. We're talking about... Republic, books six through seven. Back to the Republic. We were talking about the Republic a couple of weeks ago. We were talking about books one and two. And then we stepped away, and now we're coming back to talk about books six through seven. The whole purpose of this, the reason why we've returned to the Republic, and this is pretty much our focus on Plato from here on out. We're only going to read one more thing from Plato. We're going to read a dialogue called Parmenides. But uh, I think that the second half of our focus on Phaedo, which we just finished, our discussion about 6 and 7 in Republic and our discussion of uh, Plato's Parmenides are all focused on the same thing, this question of what is going on with the theory of forms. What are these forms? How does this theory work? What is, go like what, what is Plato talking about when he's talking about his theory of forms? And it's not entirely clear. We got a first pass when we were looking at Phaedo. This is a dialogue that at least on its surface is about Socrates' death and the immortality of the soul, but very, very quickly we notice that that question of whether the soul is immortal quickly turns into a question about exactly what the nature of the things that the soul apprehends, what kind of knowledge does the soul have, what is it knowledge of, and therefore somehow this question of like, oh, so what then is the nature of the soul? And I think that this is a question that's in it's, the answer to it is incredibly ambiguous. We don't get a straight, surprise, surprise. We don't get a straight answer from Plato on this. And maybe this is intentional. We know that this is a big part of his theory of education as well, is that he's, not, he's never going to just give you the answer to a question. Even if he knew it, which perhaps he doesn't, but even if he did know it, just telling you wouldn't help you out at all. Something about kind of laying the breadcrumbs of, well-posed questions that gets you to discover things for yourselves. This is a far better way of learning something. <clears throat> so what is it that we do know about the forms so far? What can we say about the forms? We've looked at this at least a little bit in talking about Phaedo. What are forms? Yeah, okay. Sure. For example? Like the uh, table example, the table is perfect, but its tableness is. Okay, yeah. So this, there's this suffix ness, right? That I can add to something that kind of gets at maybe what the forms are all about, their essence. So we've got a table, right? A concrete particular table, and then we've got some sort of essence of the table. Not even the table, essence of tables, right? Essence of like tableness. That we could say something like it's by virtue of tableness that this particular table is a table. We have this question of the relationship between essences, maybe we want to call them um, universals, which are abstract things. And how these are different than particular things. Concrete things, maybe material things. And we saw a lot of this in Phaedo in conversations about the relationship between the body, which seems to be on this side, and the soul, which seems to maybe be on this side. You have a body, but there's some essence of you, perhaps, and this is the soul, maybe. Although, as, as we see in the... Uh, the 
reflection draft prompt that we have for this week, it's a little more complicated than that because you are not, you're not purely an abstract universal. There's something individual about you that makes you you as opposed to somebody else. So this is, this is really, really tricky. Andrew, you had your hand up? Oh, that was really, yeah. I guess you could also say abstracts or generally. Could you say they're indestructible? Yeah. So we have this, yeah, this idea of, like, a lot of stuff comes along with this, right? We have destructibility, the capacity for uh, coming to be and perishing on this side, some kind of eternal unchanging aspect on this side, so Socrates seems to be saying. So Plato seems to be saying. I'm just going to shift away from Socrates now when I say, like, I'm talking about the theory of forms. I'm pretty sure the theory of forms is Plato talking, maybe putting some words into Socrates' mouth. Um, so yeah, there's that. Uh, something that we didn't really talk about, which is uh, something that pops up in the response that Socrates offers to Cebes' idea that the soul is to the body as the tailor is to the cloak, is this uh, way in which opposites can mix in the concrete particulars. Some concrete particular thing might have like uh, a little bit of hot and a little bit of cold, might be kind of partially tall and partially... Short, I suppose. We can think about like me, for example. I am one particular thing. Am I tall? Compared to my grandmother? Yeah. I guess I'm tall. Compared to almost anybody else? No, not so much. Am I both tall and not tall? This seems strange, right? For something to be both tall and not tall, but perhaps I'm tall and not tall in some kind of, in different respects. Tallness itself, though, is tallness itself, does that have any part of shortness in it? Is there any admixture of shortness in tallness itself? Does it even make sense to talk about the tallness or shortness of tallness itself? These are the sorts of problems we're going to start to discover in Parmenides. But yeah, this is what we've got going on so far with the theory of forms. Any questions about this just yet? Yeah, I'll give, you, I'll give you some. We had one already, and I'm going to give you some examples. I'm going to go ahead and warn you. By the end of the class today, I'm going to take a lot of those examples back and be like, eh, not really. There's a, there's a little bit of a, like a, you know, we're kind of climbing a ladder here. So we'll, we'll say like, oh, it's kind of like this. And then we'll be like, eh, not really. But we, we kind of like use that ladder to get someplace where we can get closer to what the real answer is. Maybe we'll get there. Maybe we won't. But table, right? Concrete particular table. What about the form of a table? What about tableness itself? Is tableness itself any one particular concrete thing? No. This table can be destroyed. Can tableness be destroyed? Kind of hard to see how. I can destroy all of the tables in the world, but tableness itself will still be tableness, right? And it doesn't change. Whatever the ideal form of a table is, seems to perhaps not change. This might be a better example. Justice. Justice is an abstract thing. It's a universal thing. It's a kind of an essence. It's something that's apprehended by the mind, not through the bodily senses. Justice itself is not any one particular thing. A justice system can be destroyed. It can be dis created, right? One particular political body's version of justice. But justice itself can't be destroyed just by destroying justice systems, right? I could burn all the courts down, I could kill all the judges, but I can't destroy justice. And the idea here also is that justice never changes. Whatever capital J real justice is, never changes. People's ideas of justice will change, but those, aren't, those are on this side, right? And this stuff starts to get complicated as well, because before when we were talking about abstract universal things, I used this word idea. In fact, Plato uses this word idea. And we're going to need to start making distinctions between ideas as they exist in particular people's heads versus ideas as they might exist independent of any thinkers. And one way to think about this, you might have trouble with this. You might be like, what the hell is an idea that's independent of a thinker? Are there objects that can be seen? Do they exist independent of anybody seeing them? That, yeah, the SAS Percipia, as Bishop Barclay says, 
but he's crazy. Yeah. Um, um, maybe, maybe. So uh, th this is an interesting question. We could say something like red, the color red. Is the color red out there in the world regardless of whether or not there's anybody who sees red? If we all went colorblind, would redness still exist? Yep. Redness, is that on this side or is it on this side? I'm not really sure, but at least we get some sense of like what it is that, that it would mean to say that something is independent of its perception. Whether we're talking about bodily sensory perception or we're talking about mental intellectual apprehension. Which I won't really call perception, but there's, there seems like there's something similar going on, right? That when I think of justice, perhaps it's because there is a real justice out there to be thought. Yes? Mm -hmm. Why were they saying, like, if Socrates brought up the, uh, the idea that the soul is abstract, that it, in that form it could be immortal that way, would, why would they argue that it could still perish if it was abstract? Kind of like what you said, can a table, can tableness be destroyed? Like, everybody's concept of the perfect table is different. Maybe everybody's concept of the soul is different, but you can't destroy that. Why would they? Why were they argue, arguing that, like, perhaps it could still perish, or it's not immortal? So yeah, why would we? Why would we even suggest? Why would we even have questions about whether or not the soul can be destroyed if we've already agreed that the soul is an abstract thing? Yeah. Stanton, do you have an answer for that? Um, well, yeah. There's there's two ways to think about it. If the soul is completely like. The, the abstract forms, there's a really only like the one same soul that's being attributed to each person, and they're only the image of the soul <clears throat> or the, the physical form of the soul, and it's it's a particular instance of soulness, but it's not exactly the soul, so then that couldn't be you know, it, it couldn't be immortal if it's not the precise soul, or it's not the form of the soul, but that's, that would be required for people to have individual souls if the soul is like the forms. But if the soul is not like the forms, and it is a concrete particular thing, then your individual soul itself could possibly not be eternal. I really hope the microphone picked that up. It did. I put it right did it? Soon. It moved over towards me. Okay, good. Well, I hope the microphone's working today, <laughs> at least. Um, um, that was good. Here's, here's maybe a, a question. Did you understand it? Did you find it, as you were talking about it, Stan, did you find it like this is, uh, how, like, this is really difficult it's to talk about? It's hard to articulate. Yeah, it is. It's hard to articulate, but you feel like you've got it. Like, like I have a sense of something, I know but I'm just I having said. trouble putting it into words, right? Do you think you understand? Yeah. So this is like one of the things that might be on the line here is this question of like, is the soul actually concrete or is it particular? If we, or sorry, is it con a concrete particular or is it an abstract universal sort of thing? If it is in fact an abstract universal thing, then perhaps the soul is a very different thing than most people think it is. It's going to be something like the form of all human life, perhaps, or the form of like, even if I was talking about the form of my particular life, that's not, that's not the average person's idea of like a spirit that leaves the body and goes on to like live some afterlife that could either be pleasant or unpleasant or something like that. It's going to be something very, very different. It's going to be, your soul is going to be something more or less like an idea if it's the sort of thing that's eternal, which is a strange notion. Say tableness. Oh. Yeah, go ahead. Take the microphone back. Say, uh, say tableness is abstract. And, or say uh, like the clock right there. Clockness is abstract. You can destroy a clock. You can destroy a table. Um, but the idea of the, you know, the ideal table or the ideal clock, they're both different. So you can't Wait. really... Wait, what's both different? The ideal clock and the idea, ideal table are different from one another? Yeah, so maybe okay. if you put that towards souls, that maybe all the souls are still abstract, but they're all different. And that, it's, it's kind of hard for me to put that into words, but yeah. maybe, maybe... There's a lot soul, of that going around. Yeah, maybe, 
like there. <laughs> Maybe there is like like every soul to like to themselves is just like they're they're abstract in their own way, but they're still different. So the difference between my soul and your soul is like the difference so, between the form of the clock and the form of the table. Yes. Why not my soul and your soul are like the difference between the form of this clock and the form of the clock in the next room? Because Which is to say, they're both partaking of clockness. Yes, they are, but. You, and the form of the clock versus the form of the table is maybe more like the form of a human soul versus the form of a, I don't know, a spider soul. So would you say something like the table has really good clockness? or the, the clock I would say has, the table has almost no clockness. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe, maybe every soul is different in that regard. Maybe every soul is like, say my soul it has very good clockness, but your soul has very good tableness. We're not going to compare the two. They're, you can't destroy the concept of it, yeah. but they're abstract in their own ways. Yeah. I think you're, you're, you're on to something here. This, there is this question. I think this is a question that like, we're all going to run into when we, talk about, when we start talking about um, abstract universals, when we start talking about the generalities. For example, this uh, seems like we might say the, the same sort of thing. Uh, the difference between what Stanton is saying and what you're saying, Giorgio, might be the same sort of conversation as we might have seen between Socrates and Mino, where Mino says every person has a different virtue, right? Different excellence for me versus a different excellence for you. And then Socrates might come back and say something like, yes, but we all call them virtue, right? We call them all virtue, my virtue, your virtue, and they all seem to have something in common, right? You can't be an excellent you without justice and moderation. I can't be an excellent me without justice and moderation. So instead of trying to make many out of one, let's talk about what they all have in common. Let's talk about some kind of universal. In which case, I might even say something like um, the spider soul and the human soul. They probably have something in common. Perhaps, I don't know, can a spider be a good spider without being just and moderate? Is justice and moderation, is this even on the, on the map for the spider? <laughs> Whatever it is about clocks that make them good clocks, does that have anything in common at all with like, what makes tables good tables? This is stuff that we're going to be getting into today, this question of like, we've got, we've got a variety of different kind of levels or different senses, depending on like what perspective we take on this, on whether we're talking about particular things or universal things. And this seems relatively important because there seems to be a pretty sharp divide in Plato's metaphysics and ontology here. So we want to get a, try to get, I'm gonna, I'll emphasize that, we want to try to get a good grip on what it is that he's talking about. We might succeed. We might only participate in success a little bit without fully grasping it. So this is what we've got going on so far. And uh, we had, when we, uh, refresh my memory, what was going on in Republic 1 and 2? Yeah, or Polemarchus, yeah. Polemarchus, yeah. He stops them. He's like, you have to go to my house. Socrates is like, oh, why? He's like, well, how are you going to not make us go to your house? So they go to his, you know, Polemarchus' house. A little less detail. Yeah. Um, and then there's, a, there's, a, there's the first idea of what is justice, you know? Ah, justice, right. Okay, yes, good. All right, so yeah. So book one is all about justice, right? We get an idea from Polemarchus that it's uh, giving people what they're owed, and then Socrates and Polemarchus have a conversation about that. Then we have the conversation with... Thrasymachus, yeah, where we get a very different picture of justice. And perhaps what we've got on the line here is Thrasymachus at least starts off wanting to talk about justice as it actually gets practice in particular instances, right? What gets called justice in the real, actual world? And Socrates wants to talk about something bigger, something more abstract. And Thrasymachus loses, the, like, whatever, whatever ledge he had to hold on to kind of, like, to kind of like maintain that position in contradistinction to Socrates, all of that gets flushed down the toilet as soon as Thrasymachus says, I was talking about the ruler in the precise sense. And now it's like, he's not talking about actual rulers anymore, he's talking about ideal rulers. And then everything goes just completely haywire for Thrasymachus. And then in book two, we get the myth of Gyges and this big question about, is justice good for its own sake? Is it good for its consequences? And uh, this question of like, can a just person actually thrive? Can a just person be happy? Or is a just person destined to be a sucker? 
This is what Thrasymachus seems to be suggesting, right? That it's, it's madness. It's, just, it's a high-minded simplicity at best, if not just utter stupidity, to try to be just when it's clear that injustice gets you more. So this is all about justice. And we have this question that's posed by the myth of Gyges. It's kind of, we could sum it up as, why be just? Or can a just person flourish? Can a just person be happy? Is justice actually good for us? Is it good for you to be a just person? And Socrates maintains that yes, it is good for It's good for its own sake. It's also good for its consequences. But it's hard to see how we can maintain that in light of this myth of Gyges. And that's where we left off in book two of Republic. We're going to get over here into 6 and 7 today. In book 6, we get the famous allegory of the cave. Just a quick show of hands. Have you, heard, have you heard this allegory of the cave before? You've maybe even read it before in another class? All right, that's a lot of folks. Um, perhaps you understood it the last time you heard it. I'm going to hope, hopefully, this class is going to give you some new angles on the allegory of the cave. My take on this is while the allegory of the cave is kind of fun and cool and like lots of, there's something accessible about it, I don't think it's really all that interesting. I think what's going on in book seven is way more interesting and it actually informs a lot of like what it is that we can say about the allegory of the cave. That is the divided line. Uh, I got this backwards, didn't I? Yeah, yeah sorry. I saw, I saw the puzzled looks and I'm like, what are they, what is, what's everybody? Um, the reason why I got this backwards, by the way, is because I actually think the order of exposition, this is, I know, this is sacrilege. Plato's way smarter than me. How dare I say this? I think he gets the order of exposition wrong. I think it's way easier to understand if we get the allegory first and then the divided line second. There's, there's something kind of, I don't know, there's something that works out nice about it. Um, what's going on in the meantime? Let me fill in some of the gaps, the things that are going on in books three, four, and five. So we have this question of why be just and can a just person flourish? And I think I've maybe kind of already indicated that like big part of the answer and in fact what creates the structure for the entirety of the rest of Republic is Socrates pointing out that, well, a just person can't flourish in an unjust city. The real question here is that like, if justice is going to be both good for its own sake and for its consequences, we need to look at the way that justice would play out in a just city, in the ideal city. So we need, uh, we're talking about the, not, the, not a, an unjust city, not an ugly city, but a beautiful city, the Callipolis. What would, what would an ideal society look like? And could a just person be happy there? Clearly, in a corrupt and unjust society, the just person is not going to fare well. But maybe we want to look at it here instead. And we have questions about like, what, would this, what would this sort of society look like? We get a big city soul analogy. that goes running through the entirety of the rest of Republic as well, in which we talk about how the city is structured like the soul is structured. And in order for the city to do well, we need to think about the same sorts of questions as what it would mean for the soul to do well. And in fact, we might look at the two as kind of inevitably intertwined with one another. As we've seen already, a just person can't thrive in an unjust city. And a city can't thrive if it's full of unjust citizens. You need all of the citizens being the best that they can be in order for the city to be the best that it can be. And you need the city to be the best that it can be in order for any one individual citizen to be the best that they can be. Nobody can be their best if, they're, if the community that they live in is not at its best. And vice versa. The community can't be at its best unless the individuals are not doing their best. There's this kind of like parts whole relationship that's being articulated here both when we're talking about the city and when we're talking about the soul such that a harmony of the parts is going to be 
perhaps the essence, if not one way of looking at the excellence of the whole. The whole doesn't really do its well unless all of the parts are working in harmony with one another. And we get some sense of uh, how the city has parts. The parts of the city are all the individual people, but does the soul have parts? In fact, this is something that comes up in Phaedo. When we're talking about this distinction, one of the things that Socrates points out is that these sorts of things are destructible and creatable because they have parts. But these sorts of things, tableness itself, does it have parts? Or is it a unified thing? Is it one unity? We can say the same thing about souls. Do they have parts? But yet, for some strange reason, Socrates does talk about the parts of the soul and the part of the city. Parts of the city in... I think it's three. Um, we get this idea of the appetitive soul, the spirited soul, and the rational part of the soul. Appetite of soul, that's the, that's the part of your soul that fears and desires things. Mostly desires things, right? This is, these are appetites. And this is an important part of the soul. Without that, you would probably die. If you had no desire to eat food, you'd starve to death. There's a spirited part of the soul which has to do with, uh, I don't like the way that you respond to honor or the way that you kind of respond to righteous indignation. For some reason, whenever you see ancient Greek discussions of spiritedness, the idea of like anger seems to come out a lot. That's a, there's, a, a really, there's a lot to be said for the prospect of righteous anger, and the spirited part of the soul is all about this. Or a kind of a, like a, this desire for honor, perhaps, is a lot of what's going on with the spirit part of the soul and a rational soul. And these find their counterparts in the sorts of citizens that we need in order to have an ideal city. This is as the conversation goes on about like what the Calipolis should look like, we get this sense of, yeah, well, for the appetite of soul, we have um, kind of artisans, artisans and merchants. We need these sorts of folks. We need farmers at the very least, right? We need citizens who are responding to the appetitive needs of the body of the city. Artisans, merchants. The spirited part of the soul has a corresponding part of the city in what's known as the, uh, the this is the, the first pass at what a guardian class, and we'll call this the guardians, guardians one. These are the soldiers who protect the city from outside threats, or they're the, the kind of military slash police element of the city that enforces the laws and punishes those who commit injustice. You can see how this is related to, uh, it's related to courage, it's related to honor. The key virtue that's concerned with the appetitive part of the soul and the folks who are fulfilling this, uh, I don't know, this... Um, this appetite of role for the city is temperance, kind of not, not giving yourself over too readily to desire. The key virtue that's going on with these guardians and the spirited part of the soul is courage. And then we have the rational soul. And whoever this is going to be, this is the ruler. This is the, these are what's known as the, uh, what Socrates ends up calling, he says, well, these are the real guardians, or this is a different sort of guardian class. We'll call them, yeah, guardian, guardians too. These are, this is the ruling class, and they need to be rational, just like the rational part of your soul rules over and dictates what's going on in the rest of it. It needs to control your appetites. It needs to control spirit. Appetites and spirit get the body moving, but it, who's steering the ship? It's got to be the rational soul, and this is what the ruler does in any city. And the big question that pops up here is like, so what is this ruling class going to be like? Who are going to be the ideal rulers? Bunch of philosophers sitting around shooting the shit. What do you think they're going to say? Who should be the ideal ruler? Philosopher. A philosopher, right? Not obviously, right? Who's this? This person is the philosopher king. And before we think this might be too self-serving, when Socrates says, ah, the philosopher king, that's the person who should rule, he's really like, keen to point out that's not me, by the way. I am not a philosopher king. Maybe if I had gotten started on this when I was very, very young, maybe if I had been trained my entire life to rule, and to rule in a way that's philosophically sensitive, to rule in a way that is uh, attentive to the form of justice, perhaps, 
This is a lot of what's going on in book one of Republic, right? This idea that a ruler is somebody who understands what justice is. To misunderstand justice would be a catastrophe for a ruler. Maybe then I could have been a philosopher king, but that's, that's not me. I, just, I'm, I got started way too late on it. And we might also raise some interesting questions here about, like, is this really one of the worst candidates that we've ever seen for, like, who a good ruler would be? We're in the midst of a really, oh, colorful election right now. Spirited, for sure. A lot of righteous indignation going on, right? A lot of anger. Maybe not as much rationality as we would like. There is passion, yeah. It ought to be steered, right? A completely passionless candidate. Eh, maybe not so good. A candidate whose only passion. Eh, probably not so good as well, right? How good of a candidate is this for a ruler, for a leader? Somebody who is concerned with the abstractions of rule. Somebody who's concerned with the form of justice. Yeah. I think they'd actually make a pretty good ruler. I mean, I had thought about it before. Someone who is just and is um, trying to live a good life, who is like the ruler of a city or, um, or a state or even a country, I think that they would make the best ruler because they'll understand that like, this life is not all about like, your personal like, desires, but it's also about like, helping others around you. Hmm. Yeah. And Socr yeah, Socrates says something also about this in, in Republic One. He says that the best ruler, the, what is the motivation for the best ruler, right? Because good ruling is not done for yourself, it's done for others. And who on earth would take this job? This is why we have to pay people to get them to rule. And Socrates says the best motivation for the best rulers to rule is the fear of being ruled by somebody worse than themselves. So that's a, like the only, like maybe the best leader would be somebody who reluctantly takes up leadership, right? Somebody who's like, I don't really want to do it, but there's nobody better. They do so out of a sense of obligation to the city, right? To the, to the community. This is maybe something that we want. Not somebody who seems, oh, I don't know, what's the word? Ambitious, right? Somebody who is honor seeking. Uh, honor's a good thing, I suppose, but I would be concerned about somebody who got in a position of rule because they were seeking honor. Somebody who wants the cash and prizes, right? This is something that does motivate some to take leadership positions, but it doesn't seem a very reliable one. What would a good motivation be? Just, yeah, just simple concern for the well-being of the community? And themselves, I suppose, but only insofar as, like, well, I'm part of the community as well. Will, did you have something? Uh, well, you kind of touched on it. I was just going to say, like, like, the biggest problem with, like, having, like, a king or, like, a dictator is always that, you know, you can't really ensure that they're going to, like, have that interest at heart. But the nice thing about it is that if you actually have, like, this kind of, like, philosopher king, is that you wouldn't have to, they wouldn't have to, like, make decisions based on, like, I want to get reelected. Uh, so they wouldn't have to, like, deal with that kind of, like, political stuff. They could just focus on, like, what it, like, what's the most just. And they would be able to make decisions quicker because they would right. fight each other. And perhaps they would, uh, and maybe this starts to get into some of the bad stuff. What we've seen of philosophers or folks who are at least aspiring to philosophy, and like I guess in the example of Socrates, is that when they don't know, they're really transparent about it. They're like, I don't, I don't know. I'm not, sure, like, I'm not sure what to do in this situation. Maybe that sort of humility is something that we would really like in a, in a ruler, in a leader. Then again, maybe that sort of humility can be taken to excess as well and nothing ever gets done because the ruler's always just like, well, it's unclear what the correct course of action is, so we'll just keep talking, and maybe there's a time for action at a certain point. But one would expect that a wise philosopher king would recognize that as well, would say like, oh, we're gonna, we're gonna take our best guess here. When Socrates points out that like, he is not the philosopher king and can't be the philosopher king just because he got started way too late on this, now this question of what the education of the, the gold souls, what the education of the, the ruling class should look like. In fact, we get all kinds of indications of like kind of strange and interesting, sometimes shocking aspects of what this Calipolis is supposed to look like. 
or what they think it ought to look like. So we get things like, um, here, here are some of the, the more surprising aspects of it would include things like um, just the dissolution, the complete eradication of the family unit. And to say that we're not going to let people marry and have babies on the basis of attraction and love, we're going to match them up in a kind of a eugenic project. We're going to like find that, like, oh, you're really good at, or like, oh, yeah, you guys would make good babies. So, like, there's a, a big kind of a, oh, how would we say this? There's a, there's a kind of like a state-run breeding program designed to create the best children. And those children don't live with their parents. The parents just come together and they, like, they do whatever it is that, like, you know, when a mommy and a daddy don't love each other, when a mommy and a daddy's genetic profiles match up really well and the city decides that they would make good babies that would be good citizens for the state, they come together and then they go apart and maybe never see each other again. And the children are raised by the state. By the state. By experts. By the people who are, yeah, by the people who are skilled in raising children. And their skills and natural talents are identified and they're sorted into like, are you going to be in the artisan class? Are you going to be in the guardian one class? Are you going to be in the ruling class? They're identified early on, as early as possible. And they're educated early on, as well as possible, in order to excel in these various aspects of the city. And we might say, oh, how horrible, how horrible it would be to take the choice away from these children. They'd be good at what they did. Maybe they'd be happy like that. And before anybody is just kind of like, what a crazy radical idea. I mean, public education is really not that different, right? Who raises children? Well, parents do a little bit sometimes. How much responsibility does the state have for raising our children? 40 hours a week. Yeah, 40 hours a week. And it's mandatory up until a certain age. Not too different. The whole dissolution of the family unit, that part is radical. The eugenics part, that maybe strikes us as a little peculiar as well. Yeah. Why leave it to chance, right? Why, oh, well, let's just, let natural selection. Natural selection? When you say artificial selection, it makes it sound bad somehow, but it's like, it's steering the ship, right? Instead of like taking your hands off the wheel and being like, let's see where we go. It's like, let's, let's have some control over where we go as a species. There's other creepy stuff about eugenics as well, so, but like, not, to, not to get into this. There are some other aspects of this that got, by the way, Glaucon, Adamantus, and the rest of the crew, the eugenic project, that doesn't, that doesn't blow them away. They're just kind of like, oh, okay. Uh, what does blow them away is the suggestion that like, once we get something like that going on, there really is no need to have like, one group of people at home in charge of raising the children and another group of people out in the polis doing this. So like gender roles, like, pfft, like, everybody is, like, he says there's no reason why women and men can't do the same jobs at every single level of the city. And everyone's like, right. And Socrates is like, yeah, well, why not? Why not? And some of the more incredulous folks are saying, like, so you say that, like, what, are the women going to do everything that the men do? And Socrates is like, yeah, why not? And they say they're going to get naked and exercise in the palestra with, like, with the men? Ha, 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 that'd be crazy. And Socrates is like, yeah, why not? <laughs> It's a kind of a, for its time at least, pretty radical gender egalitarianism going on in this Calipolis. Yep. There's a, I don't remember what that this number was because I know uh, I haven't read this book, where the book comes from for a while. But there's that one uh, line where it's like Socrates is like, uh, all, all the men, and, not all the women and the children and all the possessions of all things will be shared among the guardians. So, I, I, if I can find this, I'll refer it later. And he mentions women and children as possessions? Yeah, like, like not necessarily. I think it's like shared amongst the men. Like there's, there, I remember um, in the class that we looked at that, like that was a big line of contention. Yeah, we'll, we'll take a look at that. There's definitely some, there's a mixed bag. I mean, yeah, he's not like. There's a mixed bag with respect to gender going on. We'll even look at the end of Phaedo too. There are some like, yeah, that, that's right. Yeah, he's not Gloria Steinem here. But, um, 
But he's, uh, you know, he's, it's maybe impressive. There's a, like a great essay by Gregory, Gregory Vlastos uh, titled, Is Plato a Feminist? And, uh, and uh, Vlastos at least says, yeah, yeah. But maybe he has a, a pretty thin definition of what a feminist is. Um, so this big question that pops up here is, is this question of what sort of education does the philosopher king require? What is it that we should be teaching youngsters who are identified as good candidates for the guardian class, guardian two class? And Socrates says, this is what they need to learn. They need to, like, there's one piece of knowledge that is just absolutely essential, that is the key to the philosopher king, and that is knowledge of the good. And that gets us to six and seven. There, we're like, what, 45 whole minutes into the class, and we finally got to six and seven. Knowledge of the good. Capital T, capital G, like big time, capital G, good. Knowledge of the good. If you have knowledge of the good, you'll have knowledge of everything else. And Socrates is asked, can you tell us a little bit something about this good? The good that is like so important. This, is like, this seems like it's a fairly crucial key to the, the building of the ideal city, is tending to the education of the ruling class. And the key to that is to make sure that they have adequate knowledge of the good. We have an entire system, uh, a political system hinging on this. And as we'll see here in what's going on in 6 and 7, we have the entire system of Platonic thought is kind of hinging on this question of the good. Clearly something related to, clearly something related to politics is going on with the good. Clearly something related to ethics is going on with the good. What we're going to see here as well is that Metaphysics and ontology are mixed up in here as well. Something about education is going on. These are like all the various parts of the Platonic corpus, all of the different themes that are going on. They all come together and they're anchored in this one concept. If we were thinking about Plato as one of the pre-Socratics and we were trying to sum him up as having like one fundamental RK, like Thales says everything's water, Anaximenes says everything is air, Heraclitus says everything is change. I don't know if we'd go so far as to say that for Plato everything is the good, although that's not, the, that's not completely untrue, but everything is somehow tied to the good. The good is our key kind of master concept for Plato. So, what is this good? Socrates says, I don't know. Surprise. It's like, I don't, I don't know what the good is. I like, have some sense of it, but like I'm not there. I didn't get the education that a philosopher king requires. So I don't know what the good is. I do, however, I've got, um, I have some sense of the offspring of the good. Or we might talk in terms of an image of the good. Socrates isn't familiar with the good as such itself, but he has some sense of what the offspring of the good are. He has some sense of what an image of the good might be. And that, he says, these are the forms. The forms are the offspring of the good. They're an image of the good. And I can kind of tell you about the forms, or I can give you an image of the forms. We have images of images now. This is an incredibly productive theme for what's going on in books six and seven. We get images of images, copies of copies of copies of some original. Um, what did I say? We're going to do the allegory first? Yeah, let's do the allegory first. Let's get that out of the way. He says, the good is like the sun. And he means this in two distinct but very important and related ways. The good is like the sun because, you tell me, this was a reading question, wasn't it? Yeah. The good is like the sun because, helps us, yeah, it nourishes us, right? Yeah. How 
How else is the good like the sun? What's that? It's eternal? Yeah, that, that too. I'm not going to put that on the board just yet, but yeah. Yeah. I'm going to run out of room here, aren't I? Um, <clears throat> it is both the source of the being of all the things, and it is the source of knowledge of all of those things. The kooky thing about the sun is that everything that there is on earth grows and is nourished from the sun. This is like... This is like 400 BCE biology and ecological science going on here, but it's not that different than like, is this pretty much true? Everything that's alive on this earth, where does it get its nourishment from? From the sun, right? Perhaps indirectly you're like, I get mine from a sandwich. Where'd the sandwich come from, right? Well, the bread came from wheat. Where'd the wheat come from? The sun. It's the source of being for all things, and because it's the source of light, it's how we see and know things as well. These two different aspects are, are crucial to what's going on in 6 and 7. So in 7, we get the allegory of the cave. And one of the reasons why I would suggest that we do this first is that we get this idea of like the good is like the sun, and then immediately we get an allegory that shows the good the sun at work and how this is related. So we're all familiar with this more or less, right? The cave is, the cave is like way deep down in this cave, maybe like a mountainside, and then there's like a big ledge, and there are people who are chained up to a wall here. They can't move, they can't turn their heads, they just, they live their entire lives, it's terrible, like veal. They're just like, their entire lives, they're just kind of stuck here and they can't move and they're just looking forward the whole time. Up on this ledge above them, oh, let's use a red marker for this because it's fire. There's fire. And then between the fire and the edge of the ledge are some other people who have a variety of puppets, I suppose. We can think of just, they have these... Like here's a tree puppet, and here's a, a horse puppet. And because the fire is here and the puppets are here, it casts all these shadows on the wall. Shadows that look like trees and that look like horses, and they're all moving around, and they, there's a great drama playing out in shadows on the wall. And all the people who are chained up here, that's all they ever see. That's reality as far as they're concerned. And then one day, somebody gets loose. They start walking around. They notice that these shadows are caused by what's going on over here. So we had, this is what we thought was reality. And now this person realizes like, ah, this isn't real. This is the real part. And this is just being caused. This is nothing more than an image of this. So we get this kind of split between appearance and reality, or between image and what the image is an image of. They wander around a little more, and they find a path that eventually leads them out of the cave. And once they get out of the cave, they see that there are not puppet trees, but real trees. Not puppet horses, but real horses. You can tell this one's way more realistic than the last one. And all kinds of things running around and having like legit dramas. So it's not, first we thought that like this was reality, and then we're like, that's not reality, that's just an image of this. This is what's real. And then we get outside and we're like, no, this is just an image of this. This is what's real. And then maybe one day the person who's outside of the cave, they realize that all of these things are caused by something else. And we come to know them through something else. And that something else is, we got to do it in red, because it's fire. The sun, and that's 
the cause of these things. That's the real reality. That's what makes all the rest of this possible. They recognize this. It helps them to understand what's going on here in a more complete way, get how everything is tied together and part of one big whole system. And then Socrates says, it is the responsibility of anybody that's freed themselves and gotten out of the cave to now go back down into the cave. Now, there are a couple of things that are worth pointing out here. At every step, going from one to two, going from two to three, and going from three to four, this is difficult. It's not easy. The first time somebody frees themselves from the chains and they look back, not at the shadows, but they look at the fire, that fire is going to be bright. It's going to be uncomfortable. They're going to have no idea what's going on. They're going to feel confused. Like, I don't know, like they were stung by the broad torpedo fish or something like that. They're going to have a hard time figuring out what's going on. And then once everything snaps into place, they're going to be like, I got it. And then they're going to keep going a little further. And then everything's going to fall apart on them again. And they're going to be like, ah, I don't understand anything. They get out of the cave. It's going to be way bright. And they're not going to really be able to handle it. They're going to be, ah. They might not even want to leave the cave. They might say, like, too, too bright, too bright. I don't get, it's too confusing. I don't get what's going on. I think down here was, like, way easier to handle. But if they're courageous, they'll press on. And then once they get out here, they'll maybe first, they'll look in the, like in the water and they'll notice a reflection of the sun, an image of the sun. And then they'll think to themselves like, oh, I should, oh man, that's bright. You probably shouldn't look at the sun. By the way, Socrates is not suggesting that we all go outside and stare at the sun. That would be ridiculous. This is just an allegory. And once you've realized all of this stuff, understanding the nature of the sun and its relationship to these things helps you understand the natural world a whole lot better. And once you understand this, you're going to understand what's going on down here. Notice also we have things like this. We have fire, and then we have the sun. Is fire like the sun? Is it an image of the sun? Is there any fire without the sun? Are they two completely different things that are somehow related? How do you make a fire? Combustion, right? You, what, you burn stuff? What do you, what do you burn? Wood. I guess you burn all kinds of things. What do you want to, you want to burn wood? Where does wood come from? Trees. Where do trees come from? The ground. Sun. It all comes from the sun. Let's not burn wood. Let's burn oil. Where does the oil come from? Uh, yeah. Where did the dinosaurs come from? The sun. Yeah, eventually the sun, right? Some dinosaurs came from other dinosaurs because they ate other dinosaurs, and those dinosaurs ate plants, and the plants came from the sun, right? It all comes from the sun. So this is, this is a kind of, it's a, it's a pseudo-sun down here, doing the same sort of thing as the real sun is. All right, that's our allegory of the cave. And the responsibility of the philosopher is to go back down into the cave, grab people, and say, like, you gotta, like I've got to pull you out, and we've got to go through this step by step. And they're not going to like it, it's going to be uncomfortable for them. They might label you a troublemaker. They might all gang up together and try to kill you. <laughs> all right, that's the allegory of the cave. We also have in six a different version of this that is a parallel narrative of the exact same idea. And what's going on here, by the way, is some account of the theory of forms and how all of this stuff is supposed to relate to one another. As a matter of fact, I'm going to try to do it bigger over here. Do you guys mind if I erase? We're all good? All right. The divided line has divisions. It has two sets of divisions. One big division and some smaller divisions within that big division. And there are two sides of this line, notice as well. And this allows us to talk about, oh, this difference between like what is known and how it is known. 
Let's start with how it's known. This is probably the easiest way to get a sense of what's going on in this divided line. Four sections of the divided line. Let's label them all in terms of how things are known. The first section, and I'm just going to go ahead and use the Greek words because they're... Uh, I think having them be a little bit opaque to us is helpful. Eikasia, sometimes translated as imagination. Or doxa, which is, uh, we can think of it's opinion, mere opinion. That is the first stage of knowledge. And notice it's the lowest down on the, on the divided line. It's also the smallest section of the divided line. This is a way of knowing things. Imagination or opinion. We can think of, uh, pff, oh, I don't know. When, imagine something. Imagine, close your eyes. Imagine a banana. A lot of you aren't closing your eyes. All right, you imagine the banana? All right, you can open them now. You've imagined a banana, so you've come to know a, you've, like, how much knowledge do you get from imagining the banana? Uh, Not none at all, right? Does that tell you anything about real bananas? A little something, right? I suppose. Some are green. Yeah, was it, well, was your imaginary banana, was it green? Was it red? It was, it was like an old banana that was all black and brown. What we get here are things that are, oh, just, just images. Um, we could think shadows would be like another way of, of thinking about this. Representations of actual things. I'm going to go ahead and put actual things in quotes. Above Icacia, we have pistis, frequently translated as belief. And the objects of this form of knowledge, I'm going to go ahead and I'll put it in scare quotes. These are actual, sensible things. Particular, concrete objects. An actual horse, an actual table, an actual bottle, an actual philosophy professor. The things that you can sense through the bodily senses. And notice that this is stronger, it's, a, it's more direct, it's more reliable than images or shadows of things. We can also think about this in terms of the opinions of others. Other people can tell you about something. This is an image of that something, right? Does that make sense? I'm getting nothing back. Do we, do we get uh, the opinions of others? Sometimes you believe things because other people have told you that. And this is not quite the same as seeing it for yourself. Not quite as reliable. It's some knowledge. It's, no, it's, it's on the divided line. It's definitely in there. But it's just not as reliable. It's not as big a share of knowledge. The image itself. The image itself is a real thing. It's a real image. But it's an image of something else. And so far as it has any share of reality, it's due to something else that is causing it to be there. Stage one, stage two of the, di the divided line and the allegory of the cave. Do we start, are we starting to see some parallels here? That why these are like two different versions of the same story. Stage one, mere opinions, shadows, images. All I learn about the world, I learn from the opinions of others or paintings that have been made of it or pictures like portrayals, representations of the world rather than the world itself. This is a way to learn about things. It's not quite as reliable as getting out there and seeing them myself. And notice that everything below this first major division in the line, there's the big division and then the smaller ones, these are all 
sensible parts of knowledge. These are the, the bodily senses. This has to do with concrete particular things that are known by the body. This is all what's going on inside of the cave. Outside of the cave is a completely different game. Above this major division in the divided line, we have not so much what is sensible through the body, but what is intelligible. To the mind, or to the soul, or to the intellect. We have two divisions there as well. On this side, we have the form of knowledge, or the, the style of knowledge, the way of knowing that Socrates refers to, Plato refers to as dianoesis. And boy, could you write a whole series of papers on what it is that dianoesis is supposed to be. Sometimes we'll talk about scientific knowledge. as what's going on in dianoasis. Literally, dianoasis means a knowing through or a thinking through. Sometimes we talk about this in terms of its dialectical knowledge or something like this. Mathematical knowledge sometimes gets tossed. Some forms of mathematical knowledge get tossed in here. It's sensible. It's intelligible. Wait, I said it's sensible and it's intelligible. That makes no sense. These are two. It's intelligible, but it's a form of intelligibility that seems to somehow be wrapped up in sensibility and tangled up in a way that like, is difficult to disentangle, maybe never actually fully gets disentangled. The way that Socrates ends up talking about this is he says, at the, diano at the dianoetic level, we take sensible things as our hypotheses and we generalize to abstraction from this. So we could say, this is perhaps one way of thinking about this, and I think it's a very productive way of thinking about it, would be to say, this is the notion of abstraction as an activity. Abstraction as like making the abstraction from sensibilities, from sensation. So for example, if I was talking about the abstract form of a dog and the way that I learned what the form of the dog was was by looking at lots of things and say, like somebody says, that's a dog, that's a dog, that's a dog, that's a dog, that's a dog. They just point at a bunch of things and we label them all as dogs and then I ask myself, what is it that they all have in common? I'll come up with some kind of like commonality between all the dogs. It'll be an abstraction. It won't be any one concrete particular dog. But that abstraction will have come from sensation. It'll, come, it'll have come from the stuff that's down at the bottom of the, of the divided line. And it won't be completely free of this. It won't be a pure abstraction. And this is why we might think that scientific knowledge works this way. You go out into the world. And you use emp your empirical senses to kind of gather data on like what's going on in the world. You identify regularities. You might even mathematize those regularities. You might say that like, ah, so there's a, there's a pattern. But it's all tied to the senses. What's going on up here is something different altogether. This is episteme. This is knowledge. Knowledge in the proper sense. Knowledge in the sense that Socrates disambiguates from mere true opinion in Mino. This is true opinion with a logos. And the only thing that we can have proper epistemic knowledge of here, in this top sense, these are, these are the forms. And then we have this question of like, well, what, which forms? Is there, like well, I was just talking about the form of dogness. Is the form of dogness up here, or is it, is it here? What's going on here? There are definitely some forms that seem to be going on up here and aren't abstractions from sensation. They're not things that take their hypothesis in the sensible world. They're things perhaps like justice, like the beautiful. Maybe other things like the equal. These things that are really good candidates for the legit capital F forms rather than 
other pseudo forms. We're going to get into this when we start looking at, at Parmenides, the complications that come in with thinking about the forms as maybe things that are going on down here versus things that are going on up here. And then, of course, what ties it all together is the form of the good. All of these legit forms are clearly images of the good. The just. Is justice good? The virtuous. Is virtue good? Yes. Piety? It's good. Like Whatever these things are, we assume that they're good. They're different aspects. They're different profiles of the good. Different images of the good. They're offspring of the good, as Socrates says. It's clear to see how all of those different forms that get discussed in the early dialogues are different aspects of or profiles of the good. It's less clear how everything else that's going on down here stems from the good. And there are a variety of ways that we might try to think about this. If it's all part of the good, if this is all, this is all reality, it's just that the things higher up on the line the things that are, have like the bigger sections of the line, they have a larger share of reality. They're more real. They're somehow causally prior. They take some kind of, oh, how do I want to say this? They, they yeah, I, 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 priority. That's the right word. They're more real. They're more important. They're better known the higher up on the line you go. The lower down you go, these are things that are part of reality but they have a smaller share in reality, and they're not known as well. And they're caused by the things that are higher up. So we're talking about clockness. Giorgio brought this up. Clockness. I don't know if that's going to be up here. I don't know if you could ever understand clockness the way that Plato is suggesting that we would understand the form of the good. Can we even understand clockness as related to the form of the good at all. Supposedly, the good is responsible for everything. For clockness as well. What makes a clock a clock? What's the essence of clock? It's all about telling time? Is that how it, is, is that maybe, like is that the way that I would understand the essence of something? Like, what are, what are clocks? Clocks are things that are, that are good for telling time. To understand what something is for is to understand what it is. How do I, like, what makes a clock a clock? You've got to understand what it's for, what it's good for. What about a table? What's the essence of tableness? Is it rooted essentially in what the table is good for? What's the essence of chair? What are chairs? They're things that are good for sitting. Anything that you can sit on well, that's a chair. That gets at what the essence of a chair is. Does this work for? This clearly works for what Aristotle would call techne anta, artifacts, technological objects, things that we create for a particular reason because we want it to be good for some purpose for us. Does this work for natural objects? What's a horse good for? Is that what the essence of a horse is? Are horses good for anything? Yeah, yeah what? Good for riding? That's the essence of a horse? Horses are for us to ride on. That's, what, that's how you understand what a horse is? Sometimes, yeah, sometimes good for eating. What's that? Oh, sometimes, yeah, for, for, yeah, for plowing the field, yep, yeah. like, for pulling the carriage. Like, uh, some people are like, at any, like, living creature right now is, like, perfect, like, evolutionarily speaking. It's like they exist, and, like, that's all that they need to do. So maybe it's, like, a horse, and I guess, by extension, like, any sort of, like, living thing, you just say, like, it's good for, a, like, being alive. Kind of, like, good for being alive? Yeah. In which case, all organisms have yeah. the same good. We're all the same thing, really. We all have the same, the same good, the same goal. But then again, maybe like what it is to like thrive as a horse is not really quite the same as what it is to thrive as a spider 
or a human being or a monkey or a spider monkey. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so is everyone saying that the, the essence of a horse is just to exist to help us, to benefit us? No, no. In fact, I was, I was floating that as kind of like a ridiculous thesis, perhaps. That, um, that, yeah, that like what it is to be a horse presumably seems to be something unrelated to what it is that we might use a horse for. In fact, we might even say that that's a perversion of like whatever the natural essence of a horse is, is to turn it into a technological object for ourselves. You can say the same thing about cows and pigs and chickens. What is their essence? Well, their food. Uh, maybe, maybe they kind of like have an existence of their own. And maybe to think about what it is to be a cow involves thinking about what a good cow life is. The essence of cow is not the miserable cow in the concentrated animal feeding operation. The essence of the cow is like what a good flourishing cow life looks like. The essence of a human, perhaps, is like whatever a good flourishing human life looks like. The essence of you, if we're going to talk about like the soul as like whatever the essence of me, my personal individual identity is. It's whatever you're good for. Good for sounds like it's good for something else. Whatever your good is, right? Whatever, whatever your virtue is, whatever your ideal form would be. Perhaps something that you haven't done yet. Perhaps something that you'll never do. It's a target, right? This is part of what I mentioned at our last meeting as like the kind of this teleological way in which the good conditions everything else below it. To understand what things are is we're understanding like what they are good for or what, like, what their excellence would be. Virtue is not merely a... To, to inquire into virtue is not merely a moral question. It's an ontological question. To ask what human virtue is all about is not just asking how we should act. It's asking what we are. Stage three, stage four, stage four maybe? Or is this stage four? Uh, hard to tell. Things start to get messy. This divided line looks really kind of cool and clever, and it sheds a lot of light, no pun intended, sheds a lot of light on what's going on in the allegory of the cave as well. But newsflash, the more you look at this, the more you start trying to pick apart the details, whoa, some problems arise. It's the sort of thing where you're just kind of like, oh, but I don't get, oh, what's going on here? And sadly, Socrates or Plato are not alive or here to fill in any of the gaps for us. If it's any consolation, what we're going to read next is Plato taking a look at this theory of forms as it's sketched out here in Republic 6 and 7, and he's, he's going to start hacking at it big time. He's going to start critiquing his own theory. He's going to do it through Parmenides. That's our next reading assignment. You'll have the reading. You'll have a reading quiz. And not on Tuesday, right? Because that's fall break. So Thursday, we'll reconvene. We'll talk about Parmenides. And once we've done that, that'll be the end of Plato for us. We'll move on to Aristotle. Have a good weekend. Have a good fall break.